Hello everybody and welcome back to LMM and if you're enjoying what you're seeing on the channel at the moment how about giving this video a like and maybe subscribing to the channel to help us grow and perhaps even check out our Patreon. So far on the channel we've looked at a wide variety of different steam engines but one of the questions I keep getting asked is how does a steam engine actually work? And the best way I thought I could talk about this was to do a standalone video looking at the very most basic of steam engines and that is this, the Mammoth Miner 1. Now, I do have smaller and more simple engines like this little one here. Now, this one lacks key safety features like actually having a dedicated safety valve. And so we're just going to ignore this one for the time being. If you want to watch the video on that and its assembly and how it ran, there's a link coming up in the top of the screen now. So we're going to look at this, which has the major features of a steam engine in its most simple form. Now to look at, it's not really much. It is very obviously a steam engine. You have a chimney here, a boiler, a flywheel, and a cylinder. There's a burner just down here, and the safety valve is there. There isn't much more. When this was new, it was all lovely and brass and shiny. This one I've run quite a lot. I think these ones were built in the 50s through to the 70s. I'm trying to work out which one this is. I think it's like a, a late 60s, early 70s version. Probably. You can't buy them anymore, and well, not new anyway. But I've always wanted one because it's so beautifully twee. And it does show us some important things about the steam engine. In order to have a steam engine, you need to have a boiler, which is this cylinder here. Now, Mammod make theirs by a process called drawing. They start off with a thick disc of brass and put it into a die and basically keep pushing it through until you draw it into the shape of a boiler. Um, so, this end, I believe, is the end they start with. And then this end is where a cap is then soldered on with a special paste, it's put into an oven. That melts and that makes your boiler all together. That's beside the point. So key components are your boiler, your source of heat, fuel, or fire to heat that water. In this case, it's a tiny methylated spirit burner. And then we have the engine itself. And on this, it is a single oscillating cylinder. Now this is as simple as we can go. If we remove this by undoing the tiny screw here, we can pull the cylinder away from the block. And this shows you just what a simple thing it is. The design of a steam engine is remarkably simple. We have a piston here, which is this single component, which fits inside a cylinder here. This is the piston itself, that little bit at the end of the rod, which then will go through to where it connects to the crank. On a big engine, we'd normally refer to that component there as the big end. The cylinder of this is remarkably simple. As the name suggests, it is indeed a cylinder. And this is it at its most simple. The steam from the boiler comes through this tube up here and comes through the hole here on this port. This face here is flat. Now, the pivot that I've undone allows this to move up and down. In the up position, it lines up with that hole there. And that hole pushes steam from the boiler, which causes this to push forward. And that spins the crank to that position forward at max expansion. At this point, because of the pivot, the face moves and it comes to this point here. And that point the steam is able to exhaust out. Now, all things want to, at all times, return to their base state. So pressurized steam wants to escape to wherever you let it go because it wants to go back to zero pressure. So that means that going up here into this cylinder where there is low pressure is where the steam wants to go, expanding it. And as the face moves into the other position, which is up, the steam will then want to escape out of there. This is helped by the fact that as this comes around, the momentum of the flywheel forces that cylinder back in. The thing to note from this is a cylinder like this only works on a single stroke. It goes, chuff, expands out, and then it relies on inertia of that flywheel to bring it round to then push that back in. And at that point, the cycle then starts again. It is remarkably simple. And this obviously is freewheeling. Now, a steam engine that you're used to, a locomotive like we review or a road steam engine, has a far more complicated version of this with a much more complicated system of valves. So rather than having this moving 
on its own to control where the steam goes. We have valve gear, moving parts that control when the steam enters. That is significantly more complicated than a mammoth model. The other key piece of a steam engine is this little fella here. And this is known as a safety valve. And there are various designs of this. But the idea is if the pressure in the boiler grows too much, that it will overcome the power of the spring, force it open and cause this not to be a seal. And as soon as the pressure drops to watch the spring can overpower, it drops down and reseals. Now a mammod runs at around 15 to 26 PSI, it depending on the model, what it is, etc, etc, etc. I had a look at Willisco's, which are very similar, and they say their safety valves will be fully open at 26 PSI. Uh, mammods may be a bit lower. Certainly this thing is tiny. The idea behind the safety release valve, the pressure valve, is that it will stop this thing from exceeding the maximum design pressure. Now, I've heard stories of people who have run these boilers up to 40 PSI and they've kept, or maybe not the minor, but other models in the range. But the idea of this is it's going to stop this from generating too much pressure. In the early days of steam engines, we didn't have the safety release valve and things went badly because you reached a pressure that this was not designed to take and you'd have a rather catastrophic failure. Safety valves are great. And it's very important, particularly with these little models, whenever we go to run one, to just give it a push to make sure that mechanism is free and able. Another feature that most engines have today, which this is lacking, is a way of working out how much water you've got inside it. The most important part of any steam engine isn't the fire, it isn't the safety valves, it isn't the engine itself. It is indeed making sure that you have water inside the boiler. The reason for this is that something like this, the burner or your fire, your source of heat, is going to heat the metal up. And in a heated state of a fire in, say, a mainline express locomotive, that fire is burning white hot. And you're approaching the temperatures of which you can do forging, that a metal becomes more malleable and it becomes weaker, unable to withstand the pressures of a, say, 200 psi boiler. Water inside the boiler covering the firebox keeps that cool. It stops it from becoming too hot to a point that it can fail. And so on all steam engines, your most important point is being able to know how much water you've got in it, which coincidentally is one of the reasons that I didn't like this because it was very easy to run out of water. On something like this, which we generally call a pot boiler, it is just the tube. On a locomotive or a traction engine, we have generally what's known as a fire tube boiler. The boiler is full of water, but running through it are a series of tubes which carry the hot gases from the fire which go and heat the water. It's not just heating around the firebox itself. Those hot gases travel through the boiler, further heating the water, generating steam, arriving at the smoke box and disappearing up out the chimney. The firebox is surrounded by water. And so if the water drops so the top of the firebox, known as the crown, becomes exposed, that could weaken. But there is still water generating pressure forcing down upon that weakened crown surrounding the firebox and in the lower part of the boiler. On a proper steam engine, when we talk about the water inside the gauge frame, we're only talking about a tiny fraction of the water that's actually inside the boiler. So when that gauge is low or near empty, that means it's low towards the top of the firebox crown. There is still a huge amount of water and thus steam generating potential inside that boiler. One of these, however, when you've run out of water and you boil it dry, there is no more water. There's no more water to turn into steam and thus there is no more pressure. Yes, you could potentially damage the boiler from heating it and weakening it, but from a burner like this, a single wick of burning methylated spirits or meths, it's unlikely that fire will be hot enough to do any real damage. So one of these, it's not such a bad thing. It's kind of ideal to avoid, but it's not catastrophic. These are very carefully designed. So the fuel in one of these is insufficient that even if you fill this up with hot water ready to boil, that there will not be enough fuel in this burner to be able to run this dry. And I hear what you're saying. Well, there's no real system to see how much water you've put in. Do you measure it? Or like some other engines, like my steam engine three, SE3 here, you have a gauge. 
three quarters of the way up. So you keep filling the thing up until water comes out of there. And then you know that on this engine, you have three quarters of a boiler of water, which is the correct starting place, which again, is something that I really dislike about this one, as there is no way to tell because you just fill it from the top. This one has a very clever little trick. And that's, if you put the boiler vertically, that hole is three quarters of the way up the boiler. So if you fill it, tip it over and water dribbles out of there, you have adequate water. If you don't fill it up to there, there's insufficient water. And that I like. On modern Mabod engines, they have a sight glass at the back and the rest of mine all have that three quarters filler point. That means that we have the sufficient amount of water to get a run. And I think with most of these, you probably can get away with running two lots of fuel to one of those. Would never advise testing it, but I think that's what it's worked out. There's enough for a redundancy to do a second run. And obviously different atmospheric conditions affect how this works. On this particular engine, the exhaust doesn't go to the chimney. That chimney has no effect. It just comes straight out the side and goes to atmosphere. On a big locomotive, we talk about the blast or the draw. The steam as it exits from the cylinder ends up going back to the chimney and going up. As it launches itself up through the chimney, it creates a partial vacuum inside the smoke box and that in turn draws the fire through the fire bars from the fire which then draws more air through into the fire which then causes the fire to burn hotter. A steam engine working is making that fire burn hotter which is in turn giving more energy to create more steam. On this one the chimney is just purely for decoration. Also notice I call it a chimney. In a certain story, it is popularly referred to as a funnel. Only ships have funnels, and now you know. So with this, that's just a cosmetic. On a normal steam engine, proper steam engine, the chimney has an important part on a fire tube boiler. Anything of this side, mammals, Williscos, whatever, that has the pot boiler, there are no tubes, there's no draft, and there's no fire to affect. It's just this which will burn on its own. With a larger engine as well, there are many different auxiliaries that plug into this, which then use the steam to improve it. There are things like injectors, which use steam pressure to force more water into the boiler. This doesn't have this. This has one shot of water, you run it, let it cool down, repeat the process. You have the control known as the blower, which blasts steam up the chimney. This does the same thing as the exhaust. It causes a partial vacuum as the steam rushes up the chimney, drawing the fire and drawing the hot air through the tubes. This is useful as we can use it without moving the locomotive to encourage the fire to burn hotter, to generate steam before we're going, or to make sure all those hot gases are going through the boiler and don't come out of the fire hole door when we're firing. Again, this doesn't have any of that. And there's a whole host of other things which we can get steam to do to make an engine easier to use. This has none of that because this as I've said, is beautifully simple because this shows us the principles behind a very simple steam engine. The principles which are basically the same on a larger engine that's done in a more complicated and more efficient way. Particularly when you have your valve gear and you can actually make a cylinder push and then pull itself back in and getting two strokes rather than this one that just goes once. The other big controls that this one lacks are things like a reverser which we use to change the direction and also to change the timing of those valves that I mentioned controls when the steam goes to the cylinder to push the piston. This doesn't have it. This just has go. When there's enough steam to push that piston and make an entire revolution with enough inertia to bring it around to fire again, it will just continue to run. Completely unchecked because it doesn't have one of these. On the SE3, we have a regulator and this is a device that regulates the flow of steam out of the boiler. We can set this to an infinite amount of positions, allowing us to control that flow of steam and how much we want to go to the engines. The SE3 is significantly more complicated in the fact that it not only has two cylinders, meaning that we get two power strokes per revolution, meaning that this engine will run a lot slower because we can just go power stroke, power stroke, power stroke, and that means it will flick over a lot more gently the fact we can control how fast those engines run. But most importantly with this, we have the very, very most basic of a superheater. Superheated steam is steam 
wet steam that comes out of the boiler and this steam pipe then drops down and runs underneath the boiler through the fire and comes out here meaning that steam is heated further now on a big engine we have many superheater flues which take the steam after the regulator back into the heating area and dry it out further it makes a phenomenal difference even on this Heating that wet steam and making it dry means that this engine has higher pressure running on these cylinders and makes the whole thing more efficient, more powerful, and it's just frankly quite cool to have. Once again, this one does not have that. So that is the very, very basics of a steam engine looked at. They are, at their most simple, remarkably simple and easy machines. As soon as you want it to do more, they become infinitely more complicated. As soon as you want to be able to have continued running, you need to put water into it, you can make it more efficient. But as a demonstration of something very, very simple, it doesn't really get much better than this. So with that, I'm going to reassemble it, and then I think it's time to fire it up and let's enjoy the majesty of a tiny little steam engine. The first stage is to get some water back into it. So we take the safety valve out, check the safety valve, put a funnel into there, pour some water in. Now that we've filled it and probably overfilled it by the puddles of water, I can put it on end. And if we induct some air into it by pushing the cylinder in the other way, so it's drawing in air from here and push it into the boiler, we can see that it's pushing out the water. So if we keep doing this, it will then get to the right level. Content there is some water in there. We once again check the safety valve and install the safety valve by screwing it down into there. Next, we unscrew the bung in the burner and we can add some fuel. In this case, as mentioned, we're using methylated spirits or as it's commonly known over here, meths. And that is full. Screw that back down onto there. And then that goes there. Then next we see if I can actually successfully light a match. I can. And now we can light our fire. Which honestly is a lot easier on one of these than it is on a full size locomotive. And there's a little groove that that sits in to hold it in place. And the fire is lit. Once we wait, we can put a tiny drop of steam oil just onto the cylinder there. And we can put a drop just across the face here because that is the seal and obviously there is wear going on there. We use this thick steam oil, even on the models, because the point of which it atomizes that it turns to being completely useless is much higher and this is dealing with high temperatures, although not as much as a full size engine. Now, as this thing starts to heat up, the water starts to expand. So you can see it now starting to force its way out of the safety valve. This is our first indication of life. So you can hear now the thing starting to make the sounds of life. You can hear the sound of steam being generated. and the boiling process going on. So at this point, the safety valve is starting to bubble away, which is indicating that maybe there's some steam behind it. So if we ask it,
Now, as we can't control the speed of the burn, the speed of the engine, or the valves themselves, this just runs full power all the time. So there'll be excess steam being generated, because you can see the fact that it's still blowing off, there's bubbling coming out here. And there's just steam coming straight through here, and you can see being exhausted out there as little puffs. This is all it does. I can't control it anymore, and it will just run like this until the fuel down here runs out. Simple. And with the fire out, this one will stop making noises as it cools down. And that's it. That's the basics of a tiny little steam engine. Same principle applies to the bigger stuff. It gets more complicated, but that's it. So I hope you found this interesting, finding out a bit about steam engines, how they work inside, and just the general bits and bobs about them, and seeing this tiny little thing having a nice little run. If you want to see more like this and looking up detail into some of the bigger models and into the full-size stuff itself, let us know in the comments and of course like subscribe check out the patreon and of course we'll see you next time if you have enjoyed this coming up on the screen blocking my face will be a couple of videos of us building a steam engine like that little one over there and maybe a link to one of the live streams where we are running all this stuff so with that thanks for watching guys and we'll see you next time Ta -ra.